Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Dr. Robert Golden, the Dean of the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. I also serve as the chair of the board of UW Health, the university's academic health system. I work very closely with my partner, Dr. Alan Kaplan, who is the CEO of UW Health. During tonight's Wisconsin Medicine presentation, we're turning our focus to the future of medicine. We will share a small number of representative examples of the many, many ways in which UW is creating a bright new future for the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disease. Tonight, we're going to highlight three programs that are internationally recognized for their innovation and which span the fields of transplantation surgery, surgery, and cellular and genetic therapies. As you'll soon hear tonight, UW is perfectly positioned to build further on our traditions of excellence in these areas because our collaborative environment creates synergies across the domains of basic science, clinical, and translational research, bringing new discoveries rapidly from the bench to the bedside and ultimately into communities and populations. So to begin tonight, it's a pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Petros Agnostopoulos. Petros is the surgeon in chief at the American Family Children's Hospital. In that role, he represents all pediatric subspecialty surgeons, oversees all aspects of surgical care for children in the institution, and works closely with our health systems leadership and our department chairs in developing the highest quality surgical programs at the American Family Children's Hospital. He also serves as the chief of the section of pediatric cardiothoracic surgery. Over the past decade, he's helped to build a nationally ranked comprehensive congenital heart program at American Family Children's Hospital, which he will discuss in a moment. His clinical interests include pediatric congenital heart surgery and minimally invasive heart surgery. Welcome, Petros. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Dean Golden, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, we decided to uh, uh, give uh, the audience a uh, overview of our journey that now is a decade long uh, to build a congenital heart surgery program at uh, the University of Wisconsin. Next slide, please. Now, the um, Children's Hospital in UW is not new. Um, actually, the first Children's Hospital on the UW campus opened in 1920, and this year uh, we uh, just celebrated the 100-year anniversary of uh, this uh, uh, Children's Services and Children's Hospital at, uh, in Madison at the, at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, in its current iteration, the American Family Children's Hospitals opened its doors in 2007. Um, that obviously uh, was a huge boost in all our services. And uh, in addition to the pediatric heart program, there has been an incredible evolution of all per pediatric surgical and medical uh, subspecialties in the last uh, 13 years. Now, the history of our congenital heart program is actually not new. It was a premier uh, uh, program in the region and actually in the country in the 1960s and 1970s in the heyday of congenital heart surgery and cardiac surgery in general. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the hospital, though, was at the time a, a, uh, a, a wing of the adult hospital. And as such, in the 80s, uh, the, it wasn't the main focus of the health system. Therefore, uh, Children's Hospital of Wisconsin became the dominant regional uh, uh, player and dominant regional uh, program and had done a fantastic job. Um, UW had multiple unsuccessful attempts at establishing a uh, surgical program. And in 2010, uh, there was, uh, for the first time, a very organized effort to work towards creating a comprehensive, sustainable, academic, congenital heart program. At that time, there were six faculty members. There was no uh, specialized interventional cardiologist or uh, adult congenital heart cardiologist. There were two uh, pediatric anesthesiologists who could do pediatric cardiac cases. And there were 
few uh, ICU attendings supported by a limited uh, number of advanced practice providers. Since uh, my arrival here, we started uh, and, and working together with the Chief of Pediatric Cardiology, uh, Carla Ralph, uh, and the chairs and the dean, we started adding key personnel. It was a very slow, um, programmatic, deliberate addition of personnel in order to fill all the holes and develop a comprehensive uh, program. And this hasn't stopped. It has extended all the way to this year. In addition, the hospital opened and there was key infrastructure and programmatic development that was placed in, uh, uh, and that was put in place. Uh, the hybrid OR, cath lab, opened in the winter of 2014. This is a very uh, highly specialized uh, suite where uh, angiography can be performed, but at the same time, surgery uh, with the use of cardiopulmonary bypass can be done in the tiniest babies all the way to uh, adults with congenital heart disease. Now, American Family Children's Hospital was the first children's hospital in the nation to implement a uh, ultra-low dose radiation imaging system um, since uh, it has expanded to numerous places but it was pretty interesting that uh, we we had visitors from the major uh, pediatric and adult hospitals to see how we implemented this technology uh, that uh, QZEN system allows for 60 percent radiation reduction compared to the conventional uh, cath lab systems now we did a lot of programmatic steps. We developed dedicated uh, teams in the OR, uh, pediatric cardiac anesthesia, pediatric cardiac ICU. We uh, trained uh, our uh, staff and our trainees with weekly case selection and training conferences. Uh, we proceeded with developing specialized surgical programs like the hybrid OR program, the rapid deployment ECMO program, which is a rapid resuscitation um, uh, program for uh, uh, infants, neonates, babies, and, and children uh, with uh, congenital heart disease, and also the ROSE program for, develop, for uh, the replacement of the aortic valve with autologous tissue. Um, we, since the beginning of that program, believe that the most important uh, attribute was transparency. That's why we joined the National uh, Society for Thoracic Surgeons database, and we were one of the first programs that committed to publicly reporting our outcomes uh, in 2015. This is a, a picture of uh, uh, the interventional cardiologist and the operating room team uh, working together and really checking the results of the surgery in, the, in this hybrid suite as the surgery is, is done. Um, the, identifying even minor problems allows us to go back, fix uh, the anatomic result so that the kids can have the best possible outcome. Now, we didn't do that in vacuum. Um, the Department of Radiology is one of the most uh, incredible de departments we have in the medical school. We uh, took advantage of uh, five cardiovascular radiologists of the highest level. There is state-of-the-art infrastructure with clinical and research uh, imaging modalities like CTs and MR scanners uh, that obviously are all focusing on providing the best possible imaging at the lowest radiation dose. Um, those uh, radiologists, unlike other places I've been and other places I know of, are truly integrated with uh, our program, they participate in our conferences, they contribute in our case selection uh, process, and they're ready there to assist us in order to provide us with the, with the most advanced information for optimal decision making. This is an example of the capabilities here. Uh, we can go at any moment and any point in the cardiovascular system and tag red cells as they're passing by and uh, uh, trace their courses through the cardiovascular system. This for congenital heart surgery and cardiology is very important. As in our field, uh, one of the most important questions is uh, the uh, flow of the blood, the pressures, uh, and the preferential flow of, of the blood to different uh, uh, anatomic structures. 
Now, we want it to be comprehensive, as Dean Golden uh, mentioned, and that means that the, uh, uh, the, the focus is not only stopping at the, uh, uh, at the time of the surgery or following surgery. Uh, our mission was always to ensure the best possible developmental and behavioral outcome in our patients. And for that, we uh, uh, partnered with the Weissman Center in order to uh, uh, follow up uh, and to make sure that all our patients follow up in the uh, neurodevelopmental cardiac brain care clinic. There, they go through a very intense uh, program of, uh, of follow-up, anything from six weeks postoperatively all the way to a, a decade after surgery in order to identify even minor, even minute neurodevelopmental sequelae of their physiology and their surgery and institute early therapy so that we can achieve the best possible outcomes. That has uh, shown um, our program, which started as one of the smallest programs in the nation, uh, now has enjoyed growth for the last uh, five years. And, and this is just the beginning. Um, our volumes are increasing, and so it is our uh, geographic footprint. Uh, the mainstay of all this is obviously uh, uh, surgical outcomes. This is uh, the uh, report that we get from the SDS every six months that show us how do we compare to others, to the uh, SDS database in general, and to ourselves. You can see on the right lower corner that uh, star rating of three stars, which doesn't mean that we're necessarily better than people who have two stars, uh, but it just means that for the um, patient complexity that we see and the breadth of surgery that we see, our outcomes are superior uh, statistically superior than it should uh, be expected to be. And as a result, we have been recognized at, in a top 40 pediatric cardiac surgery program. I personally never thought that this is going to come that, uh, that, that early in our history, uh, but we have been ranking nationally for the last uh, four years. And as a matter of fact, in 2020, we uh, achieved our highest ranking. We are 36th in the country uh, following the U.S. News and World Report uh, for best children's hospitals and best ca uh, pediatric cardiac surgery programs. And this is the highest ranked medium-sized program uh, in the United States. And you can see that uh, on the left, it's the heat map of our traditional referral uh, um, uh, sources. Our patients usually are the patients that live around Madison, Dane County, uh, in the Green Bay, and the Rockford and Janesville area. But on the right, you can start seeing uh, that patients start finding our ways through the Upper Peninsula and Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which is extremely uh, gratifying to us, knowing that there are patients who bypass the Minneapolis hospitals, Rochester, Minnesota, etc., to come to uh, uh, our center for uh, surgery, especially thinking that this is a program that started um, uh, nearly a decade ago. The next goal is how to become a top 30 congenital heart program. Uh, we're working very hard to build a pediatric VAT and transplant program, leaning on the incredible transplant infrastructure of the institution. Um, although we have a dedicated pediatric ICU team, uh, our next plans would be to develop in the next three to five years a dedicated pediatric cardiac intensive care unit. Um, we had our first two fellowship uh, ships approved in pediatric cardiology and in adult congenital uh, heart uh, disease, and we are recruiting for the first uh, fellow in each of those programs. And obviously, uh, we have one member of our faculty that is uh, that has NIH uh, funding, and we are planning. Uh, our goal is to have that number increase uh, in the next uh, three to five years to three. Now. Uh, you remember who we were in 2011, but now those are uh, the cardiac surgeons and cardiologists. Those are our partners in pediatric cardiac anesthesia and the intensive care unit, and all of us are supported by a, a, a big team of, uh, of superb uh, advanced uh, practice providers, which are in the next slide, please. So with that, I wanted uh, to uh, finish. Thank you very much. For, uh, for, for, for tuning in and listening to that, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions when the time comes. 
Well, uh, thank you so much, Petros. You know, your presentation was a uh, wonderful example of how you can really create synergies by bringing together strong programs in a variety of areas, ranging from medical physics to radiology to surgery to uh, pediatrics. And that's really uh, the secret sauce for the success at uh, UW Health and School of Medicine and Public Health. Well, now it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. David Gamm. Dave is the director of the McPherson Eye Research Institute and a member of the Waisman Center Stem Cell Research Program and the UW Stem Cell Regenerative Medicine Center. David's lab seeks to delay or reverse the effects of blinding disorders and to develop effective interventions at all stages of those diseases. In doing so, his lab has really been at the forefront in developing cell-based therapies to combat retinal degenerative disease as it uses stem cells and other innovative approaches to create retinal tissues composed of authentic human photoreceptor cells, the rods and cones of our eye, that can detect light and actually initiate visual signals in a dish and ultimately, we hope, in the eyes of patients. In collaboration with other researchers throughout the UW-Madison campus and really around the world, Dr. Gamm is developing methods to produce and transplant these cells for future clinical trials and to test in advance a host of other experimental treatments, including gene therapies. So welcome, Dave. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dean Golden. And thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about my lab's research, for which for the past 15 years has been devoted to harnessing the potential of human pluripotent stem cells uh, to benefit individuals with currently untreatable forms of vision loss and blindness resulting from degenerative diseases and injuries that affect the retina. And these are diseases that are very near and dear to my heart as a pediatric ophthalmologist because I see them all the time in my clinic. And to date, they're very difficult, if not impossible, to treat. Next. So vision is arguably our most important sense. Uh, and I might be a little bit biased in that regard, but it consistently ranks second only to cancer in surveys of the most feared health conditions. And we use our vision to recognize faces and our surroundings, perform activities of daily uh, living, and to enjoy hobbies throughout our lifetime. Next. Unfortunately, more and more people are living with significant vision impairment or blindness. And combined, 44.5 million people in the United States were blind or visually impaired in 2014 when this survey was uh, last performed. And that number is expected to more than double by 2050. And likewise, the economic cost of vision disability in today's dollars is expected to double, more than double uh, from $145 billion in 2015 uh, to over $370 billion in 2050. Next. And there are many reasons why people go blind, uh, things from cataracts all the way to damage to the back of the brain. Um, but one of the more major causes uh, is degeneration or damage to the retina, which is a thin transparent tissue that lines the back of our eyes and acts much like the film in a camera, or at least the older cameras before we all went digital. And while the retina doesn't look like much to the naked eye, if you're operating on it or uh, working on it uh, in, in the laboratory, it's actually composed of uh, many layers of uh, very special cells, the deepest of which are the photoreceptor cells, the rods and the cones that detect light. And they're critical helper cells, which are just below them, which are called the retinal pigment epithelium. And, so, uh, and when one, of, one or both of these retinal cell types becomes damaged or dies, blindness, often untreatable, untreatable blindness, results. And listed here are just a handful of these common conditions, which include two that I will comment on a little bit further, and that's age-related macular degeneration and retinitis pigment pigmentosa. Next. AMD, or age-related macular degeneration, uh, is a disease of older individuals that specifically affects the central retina or macula, and slowly robs uh, affected individuals of their ability to recognize faces, read, drive, or do other important activities. Next. And AMD is more common as you age. Uh, you don't get it until you're in your 50s. Uh, and then as you progressively age further and further, it becomes more and more prevalent to the point where fully 10% or more of people over the age of 80 will demonstrate at least some signs of this disease. Next. Conversely, the families of, uh, that have retinitis pigmentosa uh, have inherited genetic diseases uh, that affects infants, children, young adults, 
and they first cause loss of night vision and peripheral vision. Next. But slowly and unfortunately, uh, the central por portion of the vision is also affected in most individuals, uh, uh, ultimately um, resulting in complete blindness. Next. And both AMD uh, and RP don't occur overnight, and that's a good thing. They take time. They progress through a series of stages, often starting with a completely normal retina that deteriorates over time. This offers us potentially a, uh, the ability to intervene at various stages to either halt or, or stop the disease or reverse it. Unfortunately, however, the retina itself is powerless to stop this process. And until the late 1990s, there was little hope of treating these conditions because there was no source of authentic human retinal cells to use as replacement parts or, te or for testing platforms to design new therapeutics. Next. Then in 1997, Jamie Thompson here at UW discovered embryonic stem cells. And, then, and later in the mid 2000s, co-discovered induced pluripotent stem cells, which can be made from simple blood samples or skin samples that you might uh, uh, generate in, in your local doctor's office. And both of these types of uh, pluripotent stem cells have the capacity to produce any cell type in the human body. Next. But as it turns out, that's both a blessing and a curse. Since the body has over 70 different organs and thousands of different cell types and cell subtypes, so making these very comp these very simple but uh, uh, malleable cells that can make all these different different cell types into a particular cell type that you're interested in making that targets a particular disease is a daunting task. But in the late 2000s, uh, my laboratory developed a process to make authentic human retinal tissues, termed retinal organoids, in a laboratory dish using human pluripotent stem cells, both embryonic and induced pluripotent stem cells. Next. Under a microscope, these mini retinas were found to make functional light detecting photoreceptors, the rods and the cones that Dr. Golden just mentioned, as well as retinal pigment epithelium, those two cell types that are affected in macular degeneration and retinitis pigmentosa. Here on the right, we're showing an, a magnified view where in red are the cone photoreceptors and in green are the rod photoreceptors. Next. And once we had the ability to make retinal tissues uh, from uh, any uh, human being on the planet, we got to work looking for ways uh, to help people suffering from retinal degenerative diseases. And currently we're advancing the technology on three separate fronts. Diagnosis of, ge of genetic retinal diseases, repair of the retina through gene therapy, and reconstruction of the retina through cell transplantation, uh, each of which I'll discuss briefly uh, next. Recently, a group of geneticists from Harvard approached us with a family, next, and this family had three children. They had two daughters and one son. Unfortunately, the two daughters were born with severe vision loss, uh, but the son had normal eyesight. The Harvard group was unable to find out what caused the sisters to go blind with standardized tests. So we offered to make stem cell lines from blood samples obtained from each child and then create the, their own retinas in our laboratory dish in order to study and to look for the genetic defect. So using their stem cell derived retinas, uh, we helped discover the hidden gene mutation that caused their blindness. And as it turned out, the disease it caused was part of uh, a gene therapy trial that was ongoing. And there's only a handful of these worldwide for only a few uh, different diseases that cause the type of blindness that these uh, two daughters, these two sisters uh, uh, had experienced. So in this particular case, we went from a family in Boston that didn't know why their daughters were blind uh, to their being uh, eligible for a clinical trial and an experimental treatment. And that was very rewarding. Next. We've also used our technology to help guide the development of gene therapy. So not just to diagnose what's going wrong, but to hopefully potentially treat it as well. Uh, the gentleman in this picture is Tim Reese, who has a rare genetic disorder called Best disease, which caused him to lose his central vision and ultimately his job as a truck driver. The disease affects many uh, folks in his family, uh, including his children and, and some of his grandchildren. So he was very motivated to try and uh, do something about it. There was no treatment and there currently still is no treatment for best disease. And we wanted to do something about that with him. So we made his retina cells in a dish and what he's holding uh, in his hands here are his own retinal pigment epithelial cells, the cell types that degenerate and die in his disease. We work with collaborators here at UW Chris Saha in biomedical engineering, Bakash Petnaik in pediatrics, and Shushmita Roy in bioinformatics 
to devise two different gene therapies that in our laboratory tests that was published earlier this year uh, were shown to completely reverse the effects of this particular gene defect that Mr. Reese has, as well as possibly all the different gene defects that affect people worldwide with best disease. Again, uh, very exciting to be, uh, to be able to use our technology uh, to advance these potential therapies. Next. And lastly, and perhaps most anticipated as a potential application of stem cell technology, we are looking at ways we can use the cells we grow in the laboratory dish, not just as model systems, uh, but actually to replace those cells that have died in the course of disease, to act sort of as, like spare parts for the retina. Um, and so in potentially, and in so doing, potentially re uh, restore vision. But to do this, to be able to go from our laboratory to a product that could go into a human patient, we had to work with, um, and we were able to partner with a local company called Opsis Therapeutics here in Madison uh, that, uh, that was founded on our technology and combined that with other technology that was started by Jamie Thompson um, uh, in order to develop cell therapeutics uh, to uh, treat blindness. We have now succeeded in creating billions of human photoreceptors and retinal pigment epithelial cells in a fashion that is com uh, compatible for human use. And what I'm showing you here are three liter uh, bioreactors. So each one of these devices is a little bit bigger than a two liter bottle of soda. And they're filled with hundreds of billions of human photoreceptors uh, derived from stem cells of individuals. So uh, again, we're uh, very, very uh, excited uh, to be able to develop this sort of technology and hopefully bring it to human patients in the near future. Next. We're now working on ways to take those uh, cellular products, those cells, those replacement parts for diseases like macular degeneration and retinitis pigmentosa, and deliver them safely and effectively to where they are needed. Uh, in this case, underneath the retina, shown here as that blue gumdrop looking area um, in this particular cartoon. So we're working with collaborators in the Department of Ophthalmology who are retina surgeons, um, as well as pediatric ophthalmologists like myself, uh, in order to be able to find these the, the, the correct patients and uh, uh, develop processes and protocols to deliver them um, safely and hopefully restore vision in, in these children and, and older adults. Next. So the exciting next steps for us are to embark on clinical trials, which is a really big step and one we're excited to start on hopefully in the next few years, to treat conditions like, ret like retinitis pigmentosa, like macular degeneration, as well as others. Uh, we also have a, a grant from the Department of Defense to help uh, soldiers who have been injured by blast injuries or laser injuries to the retina. And we want to also further improve and streamline our technology so it'll be more effective and more cost effective with time. Like any technology, this is still early and we expect it to undergo innovation um, and new iterations so that it become, can become more effective with time. Next. And of course, along the way, we want to work alongside our colleagues here at UW-Madison, as well as around the world, to be a positive, reliable, and honest resource for those who face uh, vision loss. So thank you again for your interest and attention, and I'm happy to take questions at the end. Wow. Thank you, Dave. That's a wonderful example of how basic science uh, really can form a base for exciting uh, translation into applications. And it's just so fascinating every time I hear your story about the growing uh, potential to grow your own um, photoreceptors uh, for patients that have these debilitating diseases. And finally, it's a nice segue to our third presentation for this evening. Speaking of growing um, replacement parts, it's really a pleasure to now introduce you to Dr. Danu Shamuganyagam. Uh, I will refer to Dr. Danu as a remarkable rising star who is leading our efforts to establish the University of Wisconsin Center for Biomedical Swine Research and Innovation, which is already in the process of leveraging UW-Madison's unique swine and biomedical research infrastructure, resources, and expertise to conduct wildly innovative basic and translational research on human diseases. The central mission of this Center for Swine Research and Innovation is to accelerate the discovery and development of clinically relevant therapies and technologies. Now, the center's research takes advantage of the overwhelming similarities, believe it or not, between pigs and humans in terms of genetics, anatomy, 
physiology, and perhaps most importantly, immunology. He and his colleagues created the human-sized Wisconsin miniature swine breed, which is trademarked now. This special breed exhibits greater physiologic similarities to humans, especially in terms of vascular biology and in modeling metabolic disorders and obesity. His team has created over 15 genetic porcine models, including several of pediatric genetic cancer predisposition disorders, such as neurofibromatosis. I know you're gonna enjoy this presentation. Welcome, Danu. And thank you, Dean Golden, for the introduction. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to have this opportunity to tell you about what we are working on uh, to solve the shortage in do uh, donor organs for transplantation. Next slide, please. As you, many of you probably know, organ transplantation becomes necessary when a patient's uh, organ has failed or has been damaged by disease or injury. Organ transplantation is one of the greatest advances in modern medicine, but the need for organs for transplantation is far greater than the available donor organs. As of this month, over 109,000 people, including adults and children, are waiting for an organ in the US. Last year, only about 40,000 transplants were performed. So this is limited by the availability of donor organs. So even if you're lucky, you still have to wait grueling number of years. So for kidneys, it's about five year wait and most patients waiting won't make it. And the problem keeps on getting worse. Every nine minutes, another person is added to that list. So 20 people die each day waiting for organs. I'm gonna tell you how here at UW-Madison, we hope to solve this problem of donor organ shortage. But before I do, let me tell you why we think we are poised to tackle such a problem. The UW Health Organ Transplant Program is one of the top in the nation. It also has a long track record of excellence in research. For example, the invention of organ preservation solution called the UW solution uh, several decades ago um, innovated the transplant field. So we believe that the organ transplantation program in collaboration with the multidisciplinary group of researchers here at UW is well poised to tackle the problem. What I plan to tell you might seem a little bit like science fiction, but it's not. So how do we plan to solve this crisis? Next slide, please. We believe the answer is something called xenotransplantation. What is xenotransplantation? It's a transplantation of living tissues um, and organs from one species to another. So here, what we're talking about is a transplantation of animal organs into humans. This is uh, not a new idea. Scientists have been talking about this and working on this for decades, but the barrier has been the technology and techniques needed to make this a reality, at least until now. So what animal species do you think is appropriate as an organ donor? I think you can guess from uh, what Dean Golden has told you about my program. Next slide, please. Behold the pig. We believe the pig is the ideal xeno organ donor. Next slide, please. Why? Because the pig is very similar to humans in terms of genetics, anatomy, and organ size. In fact, most pig organs are quite indistinguishable from human organs. Next slide, please. We see a future where pigs will be donors of kidneys, hearts, and so on and so forth and cells like islet cells of the pancreas, which can be used to cure type one diabetes in patients, especially children, giving them a fairly normal life. Next slide, please. But such an undertaking is not possible at most institutions because it takes a multidisciplinary team of experts and special types of facilities and resources to pull it off. Here at UW, we have what is needed all under one roof. And also because it, such an undertaking is in our DNA. UW President Charles Van Hise in 1905 said, I shall never be content until the benefits and influence of the university reaches every family of the state. This is what many of you know that we call the Wisconsin idea. Transplantation, xenotransplantation is very much an example of this Wisconsin idea. So now the question is, what do we need to do to make pig to human transplantation a reality? Next slide, please. Even though the pig is very similar to humans, 
there's enough difference, especially at the molecular level, that if we were to transplant a normal pig organ into humans, the human immune system would reject the pig organs within minutes to hours. It, it would die right in front of your eyes after a transplant because of the rejection. So what we need to do is to make the pig organs more compatible with the human immune system. We need to genetically engineer the pig so it's a less piggy. Next slide, please. Editing genes in a pig was quite challenging until recently when a gene editing technology called CRISPR was developed. CRISPR allows us to efficiently and very precisely change the genetic code. It is almost like using Microsoft Word. We can change letters, words, copy paste sentences within the genetic code. So how does CRISPR work? We can custom design these CRISPR molecules and inject them into cells. Based on how they were designed, these molecules find the right region of the genetic code in the cell and then change it to the way we want it. So now all the CRISPR has made gene editing relatively easy. Creating a genetically engineered pig, on the other hand, is quite a bit more complicated. Next slide, please. Uh, in fact, genetic engineering of a pig is very much like designing, building, and launching a shuttle. And very few institutions are capable of doing this. And we weren't capable of doing this. So let me tell you a quick story about why we decided to learn how to genetically engineer a pig. Next slide, please. This is Mason. Mason has a genetic disorder called neurofibromatosis type one, or NF1 for short. One in 2000 children are born with NF1. They will have a lifetime of nerve and brain tumors, among many other problems. Five years ago, Mason's dad bumped into me at an event um, when he found out that I study human diseases and develop therapies using pigs as a model, he asked whether I would be willing to study NF1 using pigs. For this, we needed to genetically engineer pigs. And that's what we exactly did. There isn't much research funding for uh, studying disorders like NF1. So we were very grateful when a charitable organization called NF Network stepped in, donated funds every year. Along with them stepped in numerous families affected by NF1. They organized fundraisers, ran marathons to support our work. And many a times we ran marathons and other races with them. Next slide, please. After a couple of years of hard work by our team, we built and launched that shuttle. We learned to genetically engineer our pigs. Genetic engineering of a pig takes months and months of work by our dedicated team. They put in countless hours and uh, long days at weekends and sometimes staying awake for over 48 hours. But it all paid off. Our studies have led to new understanding about NF1 and now we were working on a possible gene therapy um, uh, for that disorder. Next slide, please. In learning to genetically engineer a pig for NF1 research, we got really good at it. In five years, we went from not knowing how to do it from now to being one of the tops. In fact, as um, Dean Golden said, in a couple of months, we'll be the top university for genetic engineering of pigs to advance human medicine. Next slide, please. So now that we know how to genetically engineer pigs, how do we create a xeno pig for human transplantation? Well, we would have to take some cells from the tip of a pig's ear, grow the cells in the lab, and then we would have to use this CRISPR technology to edit, but not just one gene, but a number of genes to to change the genetic code of the pig so that the new pig is less piggy. But then there's now a new challenge. In order to do this, we have to make a whole live pig from just one of these engineered cells using a technique called reproductive cloning. Well, that's exactly what we did. After months of work in February of this year, we cloned a Xeno pig. Actually, in fact, we've cloned four of them. In May of this year, they were born. They are doing very well and are very well cared for. Uh, we have begun studies with them. Our early studies indicate that they're indeed less piggy at the molecular level and are more compatible with the human immune system. There's certainly much more to do, um, but this was a big step. And we are even more excited now uh, than ever to advance this area of research. Next slide, please. We are very grateful 
to our pigs that have helped us tackle many different areas of uh, medical research to help people. We believe they're going to help us solve this donor organ shortage crisis. Not only do we believe we can do this, we believe in the future we can also genetically engineer a pig so that it is a perfect match for each individual patient. Basically, a customized xenopig. So right now, I've spoken to you for about 10 minutes. That means another person, maybe a child, was added to that organ wait list and has begun the grueling wait for an organ. We hope to end this wait. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Danu. That's uh, an amazing glimpse into what used to be science fiction, but now could become clinical reality for so many people waiting on those organ uh, transplant lists. So the questions are really beginning to, uh, to roll in here. And here's uh, an opening question for uh, each of the three of you, actually. Make believe that um, a magic wand has been waved, and now you have unlimited resources in terms of research space, clinical space, equipment, um, funding. What would be the very first thing that you would sit out to do that you aren't able to do now because of those resource limitations? Why don't we start with you, Petros? Uh, that is a, a, a great question, and we've thought about that a lot. Um, the uh, issue uh, that every program in the country is facing is uh, not having, not only having uh, the specialists together and the multidisciplinary teams, but how does that translate into an incredible patient experience uh, from the moment the patient is diagnosed with a congenital heart disease or or the parents are uh, are getting a baby or having a baby who's going to have congenital heart disease all the way to when those patients are adults and they're going through life um, and we all know that the uh, health systems are all facing the same problem so if i had unlimited resources in terms of um, building and advancing my old program uh, i would focus not only in the development of, uh, of programs and of expertise at the physician and the provider level, but also focus in the access uh, of the uh, patients, uh, in the ability of the patients uh, from uh, rural areas, from less fortunate areas, uh, um, disparities of care, etc., to be able to interface with our system uh, bring the care close to their community uh, and use uh, telemedicine in order to uh, uh, coordinate a seamless experience. Uh, our patient experience is actually pretty good. People are very, very happy uh, with the service we're providing, but there is a lot of need for behind the scenes coordination of care, uh, a coordination care that has the patient as its center and not the physicians or the hospitals so that we can uh, get this uh, the, the families through a very, very difficult and stressful time um, and through not only with a great uh, outcome, but with also uh, less stress and less psychological burden of disease. Thanks, Petros. Same question for you, Dave. Unlimited resources, what's the first thing you're gonna do? Uh, well, this is gonna sound like that we're uh, uh, kind of a, a pig, pig heavy uh, a group here at UW, but as it turns out, um, as Danu mentioned, the pig is a wonderful model for many things, including the eye. Uh, the, the pig has a very uh, human-like eye, and it's oftentimes used uh, as um, a, a model system to take what we do in the lab and ultimately uh, go to human patients. And as I mentioned before, we're pretty good about uh, uh, product ma uh, making products, so we can make human photoreceptors and RPE and all these different cell tissues quite well. It's the installation portion of it that we still want to work very, very hard at. Um, and in order to work on that, we have to have good, good model systems. Uh, currently, we collaborate with a, a group from the National Eye Institute in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, who has a, a setup that allows them to uh, test therapeutics on, on various pig models. And so um, having that here at the, at the University of Wisconsin would greatly streamline the work that we do, allow us to move faster, um, especially in these days uh, when you have COVID and you're not allowed to travel. Um, so uh, that would be a, a great boon to the research that we're doing and advance things quickly. 
Great, great. And who? How about for you? Uh, that's a, <laughs> a really dangerous question because, <laughs> um, you know, we're very impatient when it comes to the, a lot of the, the diseases we study because they, every minute we take, every day, every every month that we, uh, we aren't close enough to something, you know, we're, we're, we know somebody is uh, suffering from it, um, particularly things like transplant and a lot of the uh, uh, rare pediatric disorders we look at. And uh, so the unlimited resources, what do you do with it? I mean, we would just go as fast as possible um, uh, after, I mean, we have plans for five to 10 years, but we would just condense that timeline. Uh, that's what we would do. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, Dave, here's a question for you. Uh, I don't know why I'd be thinking about politics and debates tonight, but there still are some political debates about uh, the use of uh, stem cells. Uh, now, I know that your lab is focusing on not the embryonic stem cells that have been the source of most of that attention, but still, uh, have you noticed on this campus any impact of the ongoing um, discussions in the federal government and also in our state government about the use of uh, stem cells. Absolutely, and as you mentioned before, we use both uh, types. Um, the induced pluripotent stem cells are ultimately uh, obtained from blood samples that any human walking the planet can uh, can can generate. Um, but we make those cells based upon the early pioneering work in embryonic stem cells that Jamie Thompson did. And unfortunately, when there are periodic um, uh, attempts to completely stop research in these areas, it has repercussions all throughout the field, not just on embryonic stem cells, but on adult stem cells as well, uh, because we work together to exchange information to advance the field. Um, and so uh, while we continue to press on doing the work that we do with the, with the idea of helping patients as soon as we possibly can, um, those types of, of, uh, of, of threats with regard to le legislation are, are very, uh, very difficult and cause us to change our, our directions at, at times um, and slow us down. Um, I know that my colleagues, for instance, at the National Lion Institute have shut down whole programs for many, many months, which takes them uh, a year or more to start uh, due, to, due to potential threats. Um, so again, it's, a, it's very critical for us to be able to work with all these different cell types uh, in order to uh, ultimately come up with the best product. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Petros, here's a question that's come in for you. You've uh, mentioned in your talk the um, NIH funding that one of your colleagues has and the anticipated growth, and you also referenced uh, the history of innovation. Uh, can you share with us um, an, an example of how uh, research going on at the UW, research going on in the school, uh, can translate into new innovations in your work, whether it's biomedical research or some of the things going on in medical physics and radiology. Tell us about a research program that you think uh, really is going to make a, a difference in the uh, uh, care of these patients. Well, our, our research program is much more tr uh, translational than than done or, so, or than Dave's for sure. Um, for example, a, a big uh, practice uh, in, in our field is when 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 patients do have narrowing of one of their pulmonary arteries, um, there is a lot of interventional ways or surgical ways where uh, those uh, those pulmonary arteries can be rehabilitated either with the use of stent balloons or open heart surgery. Uh, nobody has uh, has uh, studied the effect of that on the of the on the uh, vascular biology of uh, the lungs and therefore no one knows what is the ideal time for intervention what is the effect of intervention and what is the long-term effects of uh, inadequate uh, growth of the pulmonary uh, circulations um, it's not unlike what we've seen in caring for premature babies who um, uh, the, the big the big advantage uh, in uh, the field of neonatology is obviously that now the neonatologist can take care of the, the youngest uh, uh, babies uh, of the and the tiniest babies uh, even at 26 or 27 weeks um, and, and they have survivors. As those patients grow, um, there are cardiovascular diseases that, that come with this. And there is a lot of research on the biology of the lung uh, in uh, pediatric cardiology and also neonatology. And this is another example of the synergies 
between uh, uh, faculty from different uh, divisions or departments that all tackle the same problems at the same time. Um, there is big uh, research on uh, hyperlipidemia uh, in pediatric cardiology as well, and, and uh, pediatric obesity is one of the biggest problems um, uh, in the nation. And uh, there is uh, groundbreaking research about the understanding of the genetic uh, substrate of pediatric obesity, so that we can um, act very quickly because it becomes very, very. It has become very, very clear in the last ten years that. Um, atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries starts in the pediatric age groups, which is something that we as surgeons can see operating on uh, on, 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 on children and see atheromatous plaques very early in the development. Wonderful. Danu, here's a question from the audience, which is reminiscent of the question I had when I first began to learn about your work uh, quite some time ago. Being realistic, Knowing that we need to expect the unexpected bumps in the road, what do you think is the possible timeline for when we might actually be able to move into a human clinical trial to take advantage of, say, a, uh, a kidney that was made to order in your, uh, in your swine model? Sure. Um, I think what we're going to see is, uh, yeah, so kidney is a good example because I think that's going to be one of the organs coming in uh, early on in, in this, uh, the nature of it. Um, I think a realistic timeline is, um, you know, somewhere between, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think you're going to see clinical trials in the xenotransplantation area come around from anywhere between three to five years starting out. Um, I, I think where this is going to really uh, have a lot of traction is probably, I would say, uh, uh, about five years from now and on. on. Um, so the custom ordering, of course, is, I, I think it's about, probably about 10 years away. Uh, um, but I'm talking about uh, organs from pigs uh, with the patient being under a traditional immunosuppression sort of therapy uh, drug, drug regimen. I think we're looking at somewhere around five years or so to get into clinical trials. Wow, that's really exciting. Okay, uh, here's a question for, for you, Dave. You mentioned in your presentation that a family was referred to you from um, Harvard University, what I refer to as the UW Madison of the East, and another family from Chicago. What resources, what is it about uh, UW that has made us such a uh, leader in the area of vision and vision research? Well, I think a number of things, um, and uh, and, and for the, to starter for starters, this, in stem cell biology, we're tops in the world. Uh, I, there's not another institution in this uh, on this planet uh, that has the the power, the depth of, of of skill and knowledge that we have at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, it was essentially born here on this campus, and we've led ever since. Um, it's a, it's why I'm here as well, uh, because of the environment that we have. So, from a stem cell standpoint. Uh, we are, in fact, we're the Harvard, the Oxford, and the Cambridge, um, and uh, I'm confident saying that. Um, we also have a tremendous vision research uh, group here um, uh, with the McPherson Eye Research Institute that I, that I direct, which is a cross-campus, very rev kind of revolutionary type institute uh, that brings together all of the different types of, of expertise from any college, any, any department, gets them working together and collaborating. That allows me to work with engineers uh, so that we can devise patches and scaffolds to more appropriately uh, deliver uh, photoreceptors and RPE to patients, as well as surgeons from the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences uh, to be able to do that safely. Uh, and then lastly, we have a world-renowned Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, which is my tenure hall, uh, with great clinicians, great researchers, uh, and a clinical trials unit uh, that really brings all that together with industry uh, to bridge the gap to patients. Well, you know, your uh, response uh, emphasizes the point that the new made is that we are blessed with having unbelievable schools of vet medicine, the College of Agriculture and Life Science, engineering, uh, and, and everything else in this campus, but also in an unusually collaborative and collegial environment where uh, there's no uh, there's no boundaries uh, across uh, the campus. So uh, another good example of what makes us so special. Here's one for you, Petros. 
Um, this is, seems like a simple question, but I know the answer is fairly uh, profound. How are pediatric cardiac issues different from adult cardiac issues? And why is it important to have a program that integrates pediatric and adult um, congenital heart diseases? Uh, that is a fantastic question, Glenn Golden. Um, the, uh, the issue with uh, pediatric uh, congenital heart diseases are that those diseases for the most part are lifelong diseases. Um, and, and therefore, uh, a lot of the pathologies that we, we face start from the fetal life and, and, uh, and, and uh, follow the patient all the way through adulthood. Um, and so you have to have an integrated team with transition of care points and specialists following the patients in the appropriate age group with deep knowledge of that so that you can optimize a lifelong disease uh, management. And the interesting thing to me as a congenital heart surgeon and as a congenital heart specialist is that as you intervene earlier and earlier, the trajectories of those diseases change. And for example, um, right now, the neurodevelopmental um, uh, aspect of the care of congenital heart patients is, is a, a prime example of that. Uh, 20 or 30 years ago, those patients will not survive the complex surgeries. Well, with a lot of research and multidisciplinary team development and a lot of specialized expertise that you cannot find unless you are in a specialized uh, multidisciplinary comprehensive program, those babies do survive. And as they survive and as they reach their young, uh, uh, the pediatric years, the childhood, the adolescence and young adults, you figure out a lot of different um, issues that need to be tackled. And therefore, uh, in other diseases, um, and in other, uh, in other specialties, like adult cardiac, the, the issue is focused around um, the time of the procedure. Here, you have a lifelong uh, result of, of your outcomes and interventions, and you need to have a dedicated, comprehensive, multidisciplinary program that's committed to following the patients, correcting course when some of the ideas that you try don't work, um, and, and improve the outcomes for even the diseases that we think that we know exactly what they're doing. Yeah, I remember when I was in medical school, we didn't have clinical programs for adults who had survived congenital heart disease because there weren't as many of them or for uh, pediatric diseases like cystic fibrosis, whereas now we have robust programs for adults because of the advances in allowing those patients to uh, live uh, uh, full lives. Here's a, a question for you, Danu. Apparently, one of your colleagues, uh, a Dr. Gutman, who's a, a physician scientist at Washington University in St. Louis, another outstanding academic medical center, he's quoted as saying, I'm glad they're doing this work at UW-Madison because the combination of specialized resources and expertise that they have are found in very few places around the world. Well, wow, that's maybe somebody we could think about recruiting here, but uh, seriously, uh, can you say a little bit about what makes uh, UW Madison different than all the other programs that I fear will be knocking at your door to have you come work there? What's gonna keep you here? You know, I think it's uh, really the uh, collection of the fact we have all the different expertise, as you pointed out, under one roof. Um, and then getting engaging those expertise um, is fairly easy because everybody is willing to help. A lot of times when we take on a new project, I, I'll send an email out within a week, I can assemble a whole bunch of uh, teams of different expertise and everybody is just willing to help. Uh, and, and that's just, I think that just changes the ball, uh, ball game. Okay, we are down to our last question and we're limited in time. So I'm gonna pick on Dave for this last question. When you wake up in the morning, and I know you wake up in the morning very early to go into your lab and to go into your clinic, what gives you the greatest amount of hope of what is going to uh, develop in your field? It's absolutely the people that I work with. Um, technology, tools, equipment, while, while important, uh, is only as good as the people that are, that, are, that are using it and innovating with it. I work with amazing folks in my laboratory, down the hall, across campus, and we have access to anybody worldwide because they know that Wisconsin is a premier institution and they're anxious to work with us. 
So I feel like it's uh, we have unlimited uh, resources and unlimited ability to uh, develop teams, collaborative teams, and the mindset to work with one another and to be completely open to do just about anything. Uh, so that's that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm excited about all the work that that we're doing. Great. Well, Great. thank you. Thank all thank three you. of you, and thank the entire audience. Thank you for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoyed the program. We're grateful you spent your Tuesday evenings with us as we've been showcasing the exciting work of our uh, faculty. And you know, we've only scratched the surface in bringing you a glimpse into the future of medicine. We will be working over the coming weeks and months to put together future installations of this Wisconsin Medicine series. It's been a pleasure to spend time with my esteemed colleagues and to spend time with you and to hear your outstanding questions and your comments. Reminder, our companion Tuesday night live stream, UW Now, will also continue through the fall. So I encourage you to stay tuned to learn more about the ways in which your University of Wisconsin is advancing the good of our state, our nation, and the world. So good evening, good night, stay healthy, and on Wisconsin.